Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Study for Sunday, January 28th, 2018. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and welcome to our humble bunker, everybody. We are delighted that you've decided to join us this morning. And uh, thank you to many of you who've been kind enough to share this fellowship with others. We were yeah. just talking this morning how we can tell from the website. It tells us that there have been lots of shares uh, of the fellowships to social media, and I know that on social media, I often see people who retweet and reshare on Facebook. So thank you for getting the word out there because uh, honestly, we're, it, it has nothing to do with people, w- with a desire for people to uh, know who we are. Right, exactly. We want them yeah. to know who Christ is. Exactly. That's the whole purpose of doing this uh, on a weekly basis. And, and as we've said before, I mean, we get an awful lot out of this too. We do. So we do even this if, even if we're just the two of us. Right. It, it, because it's become a, a high point in the week for me. Uh, we, we, and you can hear, if you go back and listen to studies, there are certain, like last week with the book of Habakkuk mm-hmm. and getting to Habakkuk chapter three and realizing how much stuff is in there that I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew some of the stuff that was in there because I've been referring to Habakkuk three, five for a while and the references to uh, plague and pestilence, which were Canaanite demonic entities or fallen gods, small G gods. Yeah. But that whole chapter. Right, right. And, and that kind of discovery to me is really exciting. And the Divine Council worldview and understanding that these entities, these uh, Elohim, are real, and that uh, a lot of what happens in the Bible, a lot of the uh, events in the Bible make sense, only when you understand that, uh, is made the Bible and um, our reading of it every week a, a real exciting journey for me because we've learned an awful lot of, well, you know, be honest, uh, the, the book, the, the great inception wouldn't have been written had it not been for our Bible study. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I can remember that moment so well, yeah. you and I both looked at each other. They tur- he told them to turn around. Was that always in there? I think was our exact phrase, our exact words. But uh, and there are two more books that are probably going to come out of this too. I'm working on one right now, and there is uh, a third one that's tentatively scheduled for spring of 2019. So, um, and it's just based on the realization that the Bible is a long is a record of this long war between God and the fallen Elohim. Yeah. Um, who are trying to usurp his throne. Well, it's something that I was always taught, but honestly, to see it so clearly yeah. over and over and over again in the Old Testament, stuff that was just never taught to me. Right. And then seeing it echoed in the New Testament, and you know, we, we will go back and, and we'll go through the New Testament a second time. We've already done the New Testament, and you'll find that archived at gilberthouse.org. Look, in the, <clears throat> look under calendar, um, where you'll see... Uh, is it a calendar? No, look under a Bible study archive, <laughs> New Testament archive, Old Testament archive, and you'll find all of that there. Or you can find it at Spreaker.com or download the Gilbert House app, mm-hmm. the Gilbert House Fellowship app. There's a free app for uh, iOS and for Android devices, um, and you'll find the, uh, the archives there as well. But uh, we'll go through the New Testament again, and I'm looking forward to doing that again because we've learned more since we ran through it the first time. Yeah, about- we'll probably do the New Testament again, at least in my mind. I know you and I haven't talked about it. We'll do it again once we finish the Old Testament. That's it. Then that we'll makes start sense. with Genesis one one again and mm-hmm. start the New Testament at the same yeah. time. And at some point, um, we're going to get uh, to we're, we're going to include a second study probably midweek on the Book of Enoch. Yeah. And, uh, We've just been really busy. Derek yep, and yep. I want to do that. And we've got, I know that you, Derek, you bought some of the books to help with the, uh, you know, sort of rounding that out and mm-hmm. helping us to understand, to dig into it on our own. But in the meantime, you can do that. You can buy the Book of Enoch uh, through the Skywatch TV store. You right. can also just read it online. Yep. There are uh, the older translations, the Charles and the, uh, there's a second translation. I can't remember the fellow, the other fellow who did it back in the 19th century. Yeah, but, Charles is the one I remember. Yeah, R.H. Charles. Yeah. Um, but there is a newer one if you want to look at uh, a newer one done by a scholar of Enochic literature, uh, George W.E. Nicholsburg and mm-hmm. James Vanderkam. Uh, Nicholsburg was University of Iowa. And uh, they've done a, a translation that basically uh, synthesizes and integrates all of the manuscripts that they found. So, you know, they had to make some choices about, do we look at the Ethiopic? Do we look at the one that was taken from, um, you know, uh, Eastern Europe or, or wherever? There, mm-hmm. there are a number of different manuscripts that have been found. And uh, it adds a little more um, 
context. They've got a lot of notes in in their translation, but you can find that at uh, Amazon. I think the Kindle version is like nineteen bucks or something like that. It's not. Nice, yeah. It's not a huge investment, but it does add some interesting stuff, like the. Um, um, realization for one of the, I guess the Greek manuscripts have this where there are like three generations of progeny mm-hmm. from the um, initial union of the watchers and human women. Yeah. Uh, the Nephilim, it, it, that's, it's not just Nephilim. Right, right. The first generation giants, second generation Nephilim, third generation, something called Eliud, which yes. means God of glory. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like watching, you know, uh, well, one of those old movies with Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Release the Kraken. So um, some fascinating stuff there in the Book of Enoch. And it's not canon. It's not scripture. We we get that. But there's a lot of stuff there that is referenced by the apostles and even the prophets. Uh, for example, as Mike Heiser points out in Ezekiel, the reference to the divine rebel in Eden wa- being in the garden of God on the mountain of God. Walking amongst the stones of fire. Mm-hmm. Mike says that's a reference to the burning mountains that Enoch references in the underworld. Yeah. So uh, those ant- those stones of fire, w- those weren't the planets. We're not talking about the asteroid belt here necessarily. What we're talking about more probably are other supernatural entities. I mean, remember the word seraphim comes from a root seraph, which essentially means burning one. Yes, exactly. So, I, I think it's so fascinating. Yeah. It's really helped to inform my writing of the Red Wing Saga too. Yeah. So it's it's been cool. And we... Not only do we we learn a whole lot, but honestly, this is a wonderful bonding um, time for Derek and me. Yeah. And if you're not doing this with your family, you should be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we're not talking about listening to our fellowship. That's great. But I sit down and read the Bible aloud with one another. Right. Right. And just having a simple tool like a like a study Bible, and there are good. Um, free study Bibles available online. Uh, I like the Faith Life Study Bible in part because Dr. Michael Heiser, weekly Mm -hmm. Heiser reference, ding, 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 uh, contributed the uh, notes to certain key books like the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter six, dealing with the giants and the Nephilim and so forth. So you get his insights in a study Bible, which you don't find most anywhere else. So, uh, and you can find that online at logos, L-O-G-O-S dot com. Uh, Faith Life Study Bible, and you can uh, have the text of the scripture on one side and the text of the study notes on the other side. And just yeah. using that as a, as a tool k- to get started, because to be honest with you, that's essentially how we're getting started with mm-hmm. this. Yeah. Uh, we do we not pretend we, to be scholars, but our point is you don't, don't need to be. Exactly. You can, The tools are available. They're free. Yeah. I, I I usually use Blue Letter Bible, you know, right. it's, it's Blue Letter, blueletterbible.org, and there are all sorts of tools there, and they're free. Exactly. Yeah, Blue Letter Bible is another excellent tool, and highly, highly recommend it. Um, commentary from scholars like Dr. Chuck Missler, who, again, is not in the mainstream of Bible commentators, but whose um, insights... Uh, make a lot of sense when you consider the nature of the spiritual war yeah. going on around us. So, well, let's dive into the book of Jeremiah again. We're going to try to get through as much of what's left of Jeremiah as we can today. And we thank you, Father, for bringing us together through your word and through this electronic medium. However, people are choosing to listen. We are so grateful that you brought us together. We pray for wisdom and discernment as we read your word and pray, Father, that uh, in reading and in understanding, we would add nothing to your word and take nothing away from it. Help us to understand the word according to the understanding of Jeremiah and his view of the world at the time he wrote. We pray for your guidance in this and in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, a conspiracy. A conspiracy is mm-hmm. where we begin in Jeremiah chapter 41. Uh, as, a, as a bit of a uh, preface to this, uh, when we left off Jeremiah, um, Nebuchadnezzar had taken Israel, had taken Judah, rather, and uh, sacked Jerusalem, carried off all of the things that were in the temple, and he appointed a governor named Gedaliah, uh, who was a Judean, to oversee the remnant that was left. Now, Jeremiah chapter 41 begins, in the seventh month, and and Gedaliah was warned, by the way, that there were um, those who sought his life, but Gedaliah uh, didn't believe it. In the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, son of Elishama, of the royal family, one of the chief officers of the king, came with ten men to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, 
at Mitzpah. As they ate bread together there at Mitzpah, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men with him rose up and struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, uh, Shaphan, probably, with the sword and killed him, who the king, whom the king of Babylon had appointed governor in the land. You'd think he'd have seen that coming. Well, he'd been warned, as I said, yeah. but didn't believe him. So, night of the long knives. No, sort of. they like me. They invited me to dinner. <laughs> We're all eating together. Right. Uh, this, yeah, night of the long knives. Well, this has been repeated over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, Vortigern and the uh, leaders of Britain invited the uh, Saxons, led by Horst and Henga. Oh, no, yeah. Horst and Hengist. It's Horsa and Hengist. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Hengist. <laughs> Star Trek reference. He was a, a great character die, played by die. played by Piglet. <laughs> yes, the actor who played Piglet, the voiced Piglet in the Winnie the Pooh cartoons. Uh, so yeah, this is a trick. Invite him, get him drunk, and then uh, and then strike them down. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ishmael also struck down all the Judeans who were with Gedaliah at Mitzpah and all the Chaldean soldiers who happened to be there. On the day after the murder of Gedaliah, before anyone knew of it, 80 men arrived from Shechem and Shiloh and Samaria with their beards shaved and their clothes torn and their bodies gashed, bringing grain offerings and incense to present at the temple of Yahweh. Okay, when you say their bodies are gashed, is this uh, a sort of a religious thing? I mean, were they cutting themselves? That would be my guess. Um, mourning, that's part of mourning rituals. We even see that in... Um, well, I'm still having... I know it loaded in. Canaanite... Um, Rituals. In fact, there's a text from Ugarit in which the chief Canaanite god El, mourning for Baal, Baal, who has gone down to the underworld, he was defeated by the god of death, Mot. Yeah, to cut oneself. That's what the word yes. is it's translated here. Exactly. Uh, that was a, um, a thing in the cultures around. Now, remember that the people of Samaria by this time in history, this was uh, 586 BC or thereabouts, um, had for what, 140 years or so? When, when did uh, Samaria fall to uh, the uh, Assyrians? Like, was it 720 BC or somewhere? Mm, boy, I'd have to look that up. So, but what I find interesting about this, sort of syncretistic. I mean, they have, okay, we'll shave our beards, meh, clothes torn, clothes torn maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll cut ourselves, but we'll bring these grain offering, offerings to Yahweh. Right. He's never asked you to cut yourself. It, well, exactly. In fact, Deuteronomy 14, verse 1 says very clearly the other, uh, exactly the opposite. You are the sons of Yahweh, your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. Right. And this is, it, it's really easy from this point in history to look right. back on this. And this is why I'm bringing all this up is because there, there weren't, they, they didn't have a book they could go to, a little reference right. book that they could go, oh, here are the rules. It was handed down in their families. Here are the rules. Mm-hmm. Yes, there were written copies of this, but they weren't readily available. Couldn't go online. Yeah. Let's like, go to like Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's go to, you know, and just figure out what, The book know? of knowledge. <laughs> no, exactly. And because Samaria, and I was right, 722 BC, so for about 140 Ooh, years. Good memory. About 140 years. Samaria had been repopulated with people who were not of Israelite descent. These were people who had, the Assyrians had basically taken the Israel, the northern kingdom, who had already fallen into pagan practices anyway, and uh, resettled them in, elsewhere in Mesopotamia, and then brought other Mesopotamians to Samaria. And so their beliefs were kind of syncretized. Mm-hmm. They, they were mixing together things from other gods with what they thought Yahweh wanted. And in fact, uh, there are Sumerians or Samaritans today, not very many of them, but still, uh, we talked about this before, where uh, they believe that Mount Gerizim is the uh, holy mountain of God, because yes. that was where um, uh, Joshua had that, uh, basically delivered that speech right after they crossed over the Jordan River. You yeah. Know, decide who this day who you will follow, but as for me and my house... Yeah, so um, and but these and poor guys show up. Practices, but these guys show up. Yeah, sadly, with uh, the beard shaved, clothes torn, because they'd heard that the temple had fallen, and uh, they they may have been cultural Jews, and that uh, okay, we, we will identify as Jews because we were not um, worshippers of of Baal, or 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 maybe we just know that he's the god of the land, and so we'll you know follow him. Um, Anyway, they show up, beard shaved, clothes torn, bodies gashed, bringing grain offerings and incense to present to the temple. Uh, Verse 6, Jeremiah 41. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, came out from Mitzpah to greet them, weeping as he came. Oh, Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. As he met them, he said to them, come in to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. 
Mm-hmm. Because they don't know that Gedaliah, exactly. the governor, is dead yet. When they came into the city, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the men with him, slaughtered them and cast them into a cistern. But there were ten men among them who said to Ishmael, Do not put us to death, for we have stores of wheat, barley, oil, and honey hidden in the fields. They <laughs> bought their freedom. So he refrained and did not put them to death with their companions. Now the cistern into which Ishmael had thrown all the bodies of the men whom he had struck down with, along with Gedaliah was the large cistern that King Asa had made for defense against Baasha, king of Israel. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, filled it with the slain. Then Ishmael took captive all the rest all the rest of the people who were in Mitzpah, the king's daughters and all the people who were left at Mitzpah, whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahakam. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, took them captive and set out to cross over to the Ammonites. But when Johanan, it's with a J, I'll say Johanan. John. Yeah. <laughs> the son of Kerea and all the leaders of the forces with him heard all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done. They took all their men and went to fight against Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. They came upon him at the great pool that is in Gibeon. And when all the people who were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Kerea, and all the leaders of the forces with him, they rejoiced. So all the people whom Ishmael had carried away captive from Mitzpah turned around and came back and went to Johanan, the son of Kerea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. Then Johanan, the son of Kerea, and all the leaders of the forces with him took from Mitzpah all the rest of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of... Okay, I'm... Sorry, brain brain cramp. Then oh, Johanna, honey. The, the, it's smoking too. <laughs> somehow in my mind, I, I got dyslexic and, and was was seeing uh, Johanna, but uh, my mind was was saying uh, nothing. Uh, was saying Ishmael. Um, then Johanna, the son of Korea, and all the leaders of the forces with him took from Mitzpah all the rest of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, after he had struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. Soldiers, women, children, and eunuchs, whom Johanan brought back from Gibeon. And they went and stayed at Geruth Kimham near Bethlehem, intending to go up, intending to go to Egypt because of the Chaldeans. For they were afraid of them, because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Oops. Yeah. Chapter 42. Then all the commanders of the forces, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and Jesniah, Jetsaniah, the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, oh, we're now we're back to Jeremiah, and it's about, about time. time. Let our plea for mercy come before you and pray that Yahweh your God, pray to Yahweh your God for us, for all this remnant, because we are left with but a few as your eyes see us. That, the, that Yahweh your God may show us the way we should go and the thing that we should do. Interesting that they all came to him. Mm-hmm. I know you told us to get out and you told us this and you told us that and you warned us about this and that, but hey, we're in trouble. Yeah. We yeah. ignored you before. <laughs> kind of like, well, many of us do today. <laughs> hey, suddenly I'm in trouble. <laughs> Save me. Yeah. Verse three again, that Yahweh your God may show us the way we should go and the thing that we should do. Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I will say, pray to Yahweh your God according to your request, and whatever Yahweh answers you, I will tell you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May Yahweh be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act according to all the word with which Yahweh your God sends to us. Whether it is good or bad, We will obey the voice of Yahweh our God to whom we are sending you, that it may be well with us when we obey the word, obey the voice of Yahweh our God. At the end of ten days, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. Then he summoned Johanan the son of Korea and all the commanders of the forces who were with him and all the people from the least to the greatest and said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your plea for mercy before him. If you will remain in this land, then I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up, for I relent of the disaster that I did to you. I do not fear the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not fear him, declares Yahweh, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. 
I will grant you mercy, that he may have mercy on you, and let you remain in your own land. But if you say, bear in mind, they were on their way to Egypt. Mm -hmm. But if you say, we will not remain in this land, disobeying the voice of Yahweh your God and saying, no, we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall not see war or hear the sound of the trumpet or be hungry for bread and we will dwell there. It's going to be great. Mm -hmm. It's probably fun. (laughs) Then hear the word of Yahweh, O remnant of Judah. Thus says Yahweh of hosts. Suddenly, he's the God uh, God of armies, armies, the God of Israel. If you set your faces to enter Egypt and go to live there, then the sword that you fear shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine of which you are afraid shall follow close after you to Egypt, and there you shall die. Hmm. Not so good, huh? Yeah, yeah. All the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to live there shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. That trio Mm -hmm. that we see over and over again, sword, famine, pestilence, Mm -hmm. again, these may be spiritual enemies, right? not just ways to die. Famine is, uh, what is that word again? That is re'av, and pestilence is um, dever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Tr- translated pestilence here, but often used it to uh, specific uh, translated as plague. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they shall have no remnant or survivor from the disaster that I will bring upon them. Verse eighteen. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my wrath were poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you go to to Egypt. You shall become an execration. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, an execration is a remembrance? No. It's a curse. A curse. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, You shall become an execration, a horror, a curse, and a taunt. You shall see this place no more. Yahweh has said to you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Know for a certainty that I have warned you this day that you have gone astray at the cost of your lives. For you sent me to Yahweh your God, saying, Pray for us to Yahweh our God, and whatever Yahweh our God says, declare to us, and we will do it. And I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh your God in anything that he sent me to tell you. (laughs) Mm-hmm. ever. Here, I've got this list. <laughs> now, therefore, know for a certainty that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you desire to go to live. Because, yeah, God knew what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, as we go to chapter 43, surprise. What? Yeah. When Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people, all these words of Yahweh their God, with which Yahweh their God had sent him to had sent him to them, Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the insolent men said to Jeremiah, You are telling a lie. Yahweh our God did not send you to say, Do not go to Egypt to live there. Because that's not what we wanted to hear. Yeah. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, has set you against us to deliver, to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they may kill us or take us into exile in Babylon. Yeah. Now, Baruch was the, uh, was the scribe for... Um, Oh yes, that's right. Was he? Was he not? Was, yes, uh, I think he was. Yes, he was uh, Jeremiah scribe. Mm-hmm. And in fact, in uh, the uh, Apocrypha, there's a book of Baruch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, they are saying that uh, Baruch is um, basically going to turn us over to the uh, Chaldeans. So Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces of, and all the people did not obey the voice of Yahweh to remain in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces took all the remnant of Judah who had returned to live in the land of Judah from all the nations to which they had been driven, the men, the women, the children, the princesses, and every person whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shephan, also Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah. And they came into the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of Yahweh, and they arrived at Tapanes. They took Jeremiah too? Yeah. Well, we don't like you. But we're going to drag you with us. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, interesting that, uh, because this is not something, 
I, I mean, I remember this now, but this is not something I really remember, that uh, you've got a prophet of Israel who's dragged off against his will and against God's will mm-hmm. into another nation. Although God you know, knew it was going to happen, oh, yeah. so it's not Jeremiah's fault. But uh, this is in the, um, the Nile Delta region, which is where the uh, Israelites had been enslaved a thousand years earlier. Mm-hmm. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah in Tapanes. Take in your hands large stones and hide them in the mortar, in the pavement that is in the entrance to Pharaoh's palace in Tapanes, in the sight of the men of Judah, and say to them, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will set his throne above these stones that I have hidden, and I will spread his royal canopy over them. Oops. Yeah. He shall come and strike the land of Egypt, giving over to the pestilence those who are doomed to the pestilence. And that word is mawit, uh, which is um, actually a word that is often rendered as death, Mm -hmm. which in Canaanite was another name of another deity, the god of death, mawit. Mawit. Giving over to the pestilence, those who are doomed to the pestilence, to captivity, those who are doomed to captivity, and to the sword, those who are doomed to the sword. Now, uh, again, can we back up yeah. the, the, and give them over to pestilence or mawit? Mm-hmm. Um, this is the same as ma'at? Is that what you just said? Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Just a different spelling, but it's the same word that in Canaanite is the name of their god of death, mat. Mat. But... He's giving them over to a local deity. Very true, yeah. So whereas back in Canaan, he gave them over to local deities there. Uh Uh-huh. Hmm. Here's the question. Are these just local names for the same entity, or are there entities of place that God is saying, okay, all right, they blew it, you get them. But here's the thing. That's the part of Egypt that was under the control of the Amorites during the time of the Israelite sojourn. And the chief gods of that part of Egypt were not Egyptian gods. True. It was Baal. It was Ishtar. It was, um, and Baal was equated with Set, the the Egyptian god of chaos and storms. So what are you saying? That you think it's the same entity with a different name? Uh, I'm saying that the local deities in northern Egypt may have been the same deities of Canaan. The the, the Canaanite Amorite deities. was, I'm trying to understand for our listeners... Mm -hmm. Are you saying it's the same spirit with a different name, or that uh, for a different Ma'at name for what? was the same name as the Amorite name? It was, it was the same name. So, uh, Ma'at, Ma'at. A- M- M-O-T. Okay, Ma'at was a, an Amorite name? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in, in Hebrew, it was uh, For those who are Ma'at. playing the game at home. Yeah, Ma'at. <laughs> it was a, l- a little different in, in Hebrew, but uh, okay. just, just like in so Hebrew, Leviathan. So they took Leviathan. an Amorite name and just sort of twisted it into their own language. Yeah, sort of like Lotan in in uh, Amorite, mm-hmm. Canaanite, uh, Ugarit was Leviathan in yes. the Bible. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, Interesting. Well, again, I think it's very, very uh, telling that he essentially said, all right, I give you over to, you know, the mm-hmm. demons here. Yeah. Or the fallen angel here. Right. And here, here, the next verse is even more interesting in that context of what you just said, which I think is very insightful. Verse 12, Jeremiah 43, I shall kindle a fire in the temples of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captive, which and was a he, common practice. He, Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, okay. Which was a common practice in the old days. Uh, they would, uh, like when the um, the the Elamites sacked Babylon uh, after the fall of the old Babylonian kingdom of Hammurabi the Great, they carried off the, the statue of Marduk, the idol of Marduk from the temple. Mm-hmm. And uh, that later had to be restored to the temple. Um, and the belief was that uh, if the idol was moved, you know, that was the thing that gave the god locality when it uh, communed with people. Right. So, you know, that was why the household gods um, was such a big deal to uh, Laban, the father-in-law of Jacob when Rachel stole the teraphim from uh, Laban's house. <laughs> the gods won't be here with me. They'll be following whoever took the, the little idols. Mm-hmm. So, uh, again, verse 11 and 12. Uh, he, Nebuchadnezzar, shall come and strike the land of Egypt, giving over to the pestilence, Mawit, uh, those who are doomed to the pestilence, to captivity, those who are doomed to captivity, and to the sword, those who are doomed to the sword. I shall kindle a fire in the temple of, temples of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them, and carry them away captive. Carry away the gods of Egypt captive. Mm-hmm. 
and he shall clean the land of Egypt as a shepherd cleans his cloak of vermin, and he shall go away from there in peace. He shall break the obelisks of Heliopolis, which is in the land of Egypt, and the temples of the gods of Egypt he shall burn with fire. This is a judgment against the gods, and, and the Lord yes. is using the decision, the stupid decision. Yes. Oh, this is good. Yeah. You got to write this down. It's got to go in your book. Yeah. Uh, except Jeremiah left, 43. Left all my paper elsewhere. No, mm. put it on the back of this card. <laughs> now, let me get you another. Hold on. Oh, I, I can get uh, well, here, you take over, because Jeremiah 44 is up. Okay. <laughs> I'm up. I'm up to bat. I've been in the... All right. I was on deck. Jeremiah 44. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Judeans who lived in the land of Egypt at Migdal, at Tapanes, and at Memphis, and in the land of Patros. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, you have seen all the disaster that I brought upon Jerusalem and upon the cities of Judah. Behold, this day... They are a desolation, and no one dwells in them because of the evil that they committed, provoking me to anger in that they went to make offerings and serve other gods that they knew not, neither they nor you nor your fathers. Yet I persistently sent to all my servants the prophets, saying, so, uh, sorry, start verse 4 again. Yet I persistently sent to you, all my servants, the prophets, saying, Oh, do not do this abomination that I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ear to turn from their evil and to make offerings to other gods. Therefore, my wrath and, and make no offerings to other gods. Sorry. Verse 6. Therefore, my wrath and my anger were poured out and kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they became a waste and a desolation as at this day. And now thus says Yahweh, God of hosts, the God of Israel, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves to cut off from you man and woman, infant and child from the midst of of Judah, leaving you no remnant? Why do you provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, making offerings to other gods in the land of Egypt, where you have come to live, so that you may be cut off and become a curse and a taunt among all the nations of the earth? Have you forgotten the evil of your fathers, the evil of the kings of Judah, the evil of their wives? Mm, hmm. Jezebel. Your own evil and the evil of your wives, which they committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, they have not humbled themselves even to this day, nor have they feared, nor walked in my law and my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Therefore thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for harm to cut off all Judah. I will take the remnant of Judah who have set their faces to come to the land of Egypt to live, and they shall all be consumed. In the land of Egypt they shall fall by the sword and by famine they shall be consumed. From the least to the greatest they shall die by the sword and by famine, and they shall become an oath, a horror, a curse, and a taunt. I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah who have come to live in the land of Egypt shall escape or survive or return to the land of Judah, to which they desire to return to dwell there. <laughs> Wait, it's, it's not going well here. Can we go back? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> or they shall not return except some fugitives. Then all the men who knew that their wives had made offerings to other gods, and all the women who stood by, a great assembly, all the people who lived in Pathros in the land of Egypt, answered Jeremiah, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of Yahweh, we will not listen to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You never learn. But we will do everything that we have vowed, make offerings to the Queen of Heaven, uh -huh. and pour out drink offerings to her, as we did, both we and our fathers, our kings and our officials, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, and prospered, and saw no disaster. <laughs> it's been probably fine, and will yeah. continue to be probably fine. 
For since we, verse 18, for but since we left off making offerings to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out our drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything <laughs> and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. In other words, she's doing this to us. Right, right. And the Wrong. women <laughs> and the women said, We when we made drink off when we made offerings to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, was it with out our husband's approval mm-hmm. that we made cakes for her, bearing her image and poured out drink offerings to her? Well, Blame them. <laughs> it, and it's just like in uh, the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Yep. Adam was right there with Eve. The blame game. Yeah. <laughs> now this is, um, Dictionary of Deities and Demons has an entrance for Queen of Heaven, designation for a goddess, um, and mentioned only here in Jeremiah, you know, several places in Jeremiah, chapter 7, but also here in chapter 44. Um but uh, there, there, it it's probably re- relates to Ishtar. Probably. Probably, probably to Ishtar and then uh, the, uh, the Canaanite equivalent, Astart. Uh, the, the original Hebrew is Meleketh Shamayim. Mm-hmm. So it just means Queen of Heaven, but yeah, probably the deity Ishtar or something like it. Right. Inanna. Mm-hmm. Yep, Inanna, Ishtar, mm-hmm. yep. Queen, you know, basically <clears throat> the uh, goddess of sex and war. Yes, exactly. Verse 19 again, and the women said, when we made offerings to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, was it without our husband's approval that we made cakes for her, bearing her image and poured out drink offerings to her? Then Jeremiah said to all the people, men and women, with a heavy sigh, (laughs) all right, that's parenthetic, all the people who had given to him this answer, as for the offerings that you offered in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your officials and the people of the land did not Yahweh remember them? Did it not come into his mind? Yahweh could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. In other words, Queen of Heaven has nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. Yahweh could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. Therefore, your land has become a desolation and a waste and a curse without inhabitant as it is to this day. It is because you made offerings and because you sinned against Yahweh and did not obey the voice of Yahweh or walk in his law and in his statutes and in his testimonies that this disaster has happened to you as at this day. They were probably thinking, well, you know what? We did these things for a long, long time, prospered, no problem. But the fact is Yahweh was patient and long-suffering with them. Right, right. Waiting for them to finally wake up and smell the coffee. Mm Mm-hmm. Smell the Chaldees. (laughs) Not the Chaldeans. No. Jeremiah said to all the people and all the women, Hear the word of Yahweh, all you of Judah who are in the land of Egypt. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, You and your wives have declared with your mouths and have fulfilled it in your with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have made to make offerings to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings to her. Then confirm your vows and perform your vows. Therefore hear the word of Yahweh, all you of Judah who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says Yahweh, that my name shall no more be invoked by the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, As Yahweh, as Lord Yahweh lives, behold, I am watching over them for disaster and not for good. All the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by by the sword and by famine until there is an end of them. And those who escape the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, few in number. And all the remnant of Judah who came to the land of Egypt to live shall know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. This shall be a sign to you, declares Yahweh, that I will punish you in this place in order that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for harm. Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of those who seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who was his enemy and sought his life. So God says to them, Go ahead. You know, Mm. give the queen of heaven whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You're all still going to die. Yeah. 
Yeah. She's not going to help you at all. <laughs> Hophra was the pharaoh who reigned until about 570 BC. Uh, he led that relief army into Judah, was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, and Hophra eventually uh, was killed by his own people in a coup. And he disappeared, sometimes known as Jimmy Hofra. Yes. <laughs> Nobody knows where his body is to this day. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and this is something else to bear in mind, uh, looking at the Dictionary of Deities and Demons while uh, you were finishing the chapter there. This is a cult that continues into the present day. Yes. I mean, consider that. Yes. This was Queen being, of Heaven is still being worshipped. Right. Um, and this is not just us saying it and trying to cast aspersions on any particular denomination. Mm. But uh, scholars agree that uh, we're, we're talking about a, a cult that extends way back into the Mesopotamian age. Because if you're dealing with Ishtar or Inanna, you're going back to <clears throat> worship that extends into the third millennium BC. Right. Uh, a thousand years before Abraham, Inanna was being worshipped under the name Astarte. She was worshipped in Jeremiah's day, uh, you know, as the queen of heaven. But early Christian scholars like Epiphanius in the fourth century. Um, Isaac of Antioch in the 5th century equated the Queen of Heaven with various Syrian goddesses. But to this day, the worship of the Blessed Virgin Mary... Mm -hmm. Another version of Queen of Heaven. Just another version of the Queen... In fact, she's called the Queen of Heaven. Exactly right. So this cult continues to this present day. Yeah. She has had a very, very long career. Isaiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah 45... The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch the son of Neriah when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So we're kind of flashing back here. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. You said, woe is me, for Yahweh has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning and I find no rest. Thus shall you say to him, Thus says Yahweh, Behold, what I have built I am breaking down, and what I have planted I am plucking up, that is, the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? In other words, you're not the only one dealing with this, okay? Seek them not, for behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares Yahweh, but I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. Hmm. Hmm. And that's the whole chapter. Just a little note from uh, Yahweh there to Baruch, Jeremiah's I know. D- shall secretary. Shall we keep going? How much time do we have left? Uh, we've got about 18 minutes left. <clears throat> oh, okay. The word of Yahweh that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the nations, about Egypt, concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates at Carchemish, and which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Prepare buckler and shield, and advance for battle. Harness the horses, mount, O horsemen. Take your stations with your helmets, polish your spears, put on your armor. Why have I seen it? They are dismayed and have turned backward. Their warriors are beaten down and have fled in haste. They look not back. Terror on every side, declares Yahweh. The swift cannot flee away, nor the warrior escape. In the north by the river Euphrates, they have stumbled and fallen. Who is light? Who is this? Rising like the Nile, like rivers whose waters surge. Egypt rises like the Nile, like rivers whose waters surge. He said, I will rise. I will cover the earth. I will destroy cities and their inhabitants. Advance, O horses, and rage, O chariots. Let the warriors go out, men of Cush and Put, who handle the shield, men of Lud, skilled in handling the bow. That day, pay attention, that day is the day of of the Lord Yahweh of hosts. Oh, suddenly we're in the future. Suddenly we're in Ezekiel, we're suddenly in Ezekiel 38. Exactly. Take a look at who's named here. Cush, Put, Put and Lud. Yeah, tw- uh, Persia, Lud and Put are mentioned in in Isaiah 28 or rather Ezekiel 27, 30. Ezekiel 27 uh, in the prophecy against Tyre. Mm-hmm. Which was really a condemnation. 27 or 37. 27. Um yeah, Persia, Persia and Lud and Put were in your army as your men of war. They hung the shield and helmet in you. They gave you splendor. Now, Ezekiel wrote about um, 70 years, well, roughly 70 mm-hmm. years after Jeremiah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it, but uh, Lud was uh, known for, uh, that, that was in central Turkey, uh, the kingdom of Lydia. Ah. 
Interesting. But yeah, interesting that, and of course, uh, Cush and Put are mentioned as part of the uh, uh, the Gog-Magog conflict. So the men of Lydia, they weren't, they weren't related to the Parthians at all, were they? No, the Parthians came from the east. Okay. <laughs> to do battle with the amazing Rondo! <laughs> Along with East Man. Um, I was just looking at skilled in handling the bow, and I know that the Parthians are were reputed to have been like champion bowmen. Yeah. It's just interesting that you're actually, he's actually listing here, Jeremiah is saying, these guys think that they're all that in a bag of chips. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So verse 10, that day is the day of Yahweh, Lord Yahweh of hosts, a day of vengeance to avenge himself on his foes. The sword shall devour and be sated and drink its fill of their blood. For the Lord Yahweh of hosts holds a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. For a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, the uh, the reason Lud is in here, historically speaking, is because they joined the Egyptians in a an alliance against Babylon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Lud would have been one of the remnant kingdoms after the fall of the Hittite Empire um, in the 12th century BC, when the Sea Peoples kind of swept over <clears throat> the Eastern Mediterranean and um, um, destroyed everything, more mm-hmm. or less, uh, <clears throat> during the time of the judges, in other words. so But they, they're they often mentioned in, in a way that uh, leads you to believe that they were, re, were renowned for being good warriors back in their time, which the Hittites had been. But um, this reference to a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates, uh, is is that word what I think it is? Yes, it's Safon, which is the name of Baal's holy mountain, and it's the location of... Mount Zaphon, Yerkot Zaphon, the sides of the north, uttermost north. Um, that's um, the the spiritual point of origin for the evil that comes against Israel. And God is holding a sacrifice there in on Baal's home turf, basically. Well, exactly. I know. And this is where I was going with this. Holds a sacrifice. It's this whole idea of the Rephaim text where the, these uh, Ovarim are coming in for their sacrifice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and instead, reversing the whole thing, the Lord provides his sacrifice. And it's all of these humans and, and possibly spirits, too, who have rebelled against him. This is yet to be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. So this idea of where we see in the book of Revelation, blood up to the horse's bridles. It's yeah, not saying yeah. here, but um, at that point, the Lord calls all the birds in and says, hey, come on in, free food. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> a, a reversal of the, the sacrificial meal that these uh, ovarim had been enjoying. And, and this is what I'm writing for the, the book. In fact, I'm on that section mm-hmm. right now. These so sacrificial right meals. Jeremiah 46. Yep, already got it. Isaiah 46, uh, parallel to Ezekiel... 38, 39. Mm-hmm. For the Lord Yahweh of hosts hold a, holds a sacrifice in the north country, Zephon, by the river Euphrates. North is Zephon there, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Go up to Gilead and take balm, O virgin daughter of Egypt. In vain you have used many medicines. There is no healing for you. The nations have, and bear in mind, going way back, this is all addressed to the nations. Verse 1, concerning the nations. Hmm. So that's your first clue that this is more than just Egypt. Right, right, right. So, that, yeah, this has uh, got some, some weight. Um, because unlike the common belief in the ancient world that each god was only responsible for one nation, Yahweh is asserting his right here through the prophet, uh, that uh, his right to, to judge all the nations. Yes. Yeah. Verse 11 again, go up to Gilead and take balm, O virgin daughter of Egypt. In vain you have used your medicine, many medicines. There is no healing for you. The nations have heard of your shame, and the earth is full of your cry. For warrior has stumbled against warrior. They have both fallen together. So this idea of virgin daughter of Egypt, is that another reference to this queen of heaven thing? That's... uh... A good question. I, I don't know. I don't um, know that I have a good answer, but uh-uh. anyway. Um, verse 13, the word that Yahweh spoke to Jeremiah the prophet about the coming of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to strike the land of Egypt. Declare in Egypt and proclaim in Migdal. Proclaim in Memphis and Tapanes. 
say, Stand ready and be prepared, for the sword shall devour around you. Why are your mighty ones face down? They do not stand because Yahweh thrust them down. Is this a reference to the gods or to the warriors or both? Um, the Hebrew word is uh, avir, avir, uh, avirim and uh, just seems to indicate strong, powerful, mighty. Um, it's avirim? Diff- well, I, I don't think it's the same root, though, as, as uh, Avarim, meaning the uh, Valley of the Travelers. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, but let me... Mighty, valiant of men, of angels, of animals, of enemies, of princes, of, of sacrificial... Angels. Yes, exactly. That's what it says here. Huh. That's what it says. Yeah, I see. Hmm. Men, and especially violent men. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Why are your mighty ones face down? They do not stand, because Yahweh thrust them down. He made the many stumble, and they fell, and they said one to another, Arise, and let us go back to our own people and to the land of our birth because of the sword of the oppressor. Call the name of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, noisy one who lets the hour go by. What? That's my question. What? Noisy one who lets the hour go by? So that's what they're calling Pharaoh. It's it's his his. This is his new name according to Yahweh. Huh. Moed Moed Avar. It may Sorry. be Shawan Moed Moed Avar. Hmm. One uh, commentator says the phrase might involve a Hebrew pun on the name of the Pharaoh Hophra. Well, yeah, I wondered Hebrew, about that. Hebrew prophets love to play with language that way. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Noisy one who lets the hour go by. In other words, you you you, you claim I'm going to do this and that, but... <laughs> like Donald yeah. Trump. All talk, no action. <laughs> exactly. Typical politician. <laughs> very well. Very, very well said. Verse 18. As I live, declares the king, capital K, whose name is Yahweh of hosts, like Tabor among the mountains and like Carmel by the sea, shall one come. Prepare yourselves baggage for exile, O inhabitants of Egypt. Pack your bags. <laughs> hmm. For Memphis shall become a waste, a ruin without inhabitant. A beautiful heifer is Egypt, but a biting fly from the north mm-hmm. has come upon her. Even her hired soldiers in her midst are like fattened calves, yet, yes, they have turned and fled together. They did not stand, for the day of their calamity has come upon them, the time of their punishment. She makes a sound like a serpent gliding away, for her enemies march in force and come against her with axes like those who fell trees. This language is really interesting. Mm-hmm. They shall cut down her forest, declares Yahweh, though it is impenetrable, because they are more numerous than locusts. They are without number. Is this still describing this final conflict? Are we already but not yet, or is this well, just no, not I think yet? This, I think this is still a prophecy against uh, Egypt. And oh, I know that. Final, I'm yeah. just talking about this, this also referring to two different... Timelines. Mm, I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm leaning toward not. Uh, I'm leaning toward this just being a prophecy against the, the fall of Egypt. Okay. The daughter of Egypt shall be put to shame. She shall, shall be delivered into the hand of a people from the north. Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, said, Behold, I am bringing punishment upon Ammon of Thebes and Pharaoh and Egypt and all and her gods and her kings upon Pharaoh and those who trust Israel. In him, I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their life, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his officers. Afterward, Egypt shall be inhabited as in the days of old, declares Yahweh. You just thought uh, you know, I, well, Ammon of Thebes. I, I just realized that that's like Amun, uh, the the sun god. Yes, yeah, duh. But fear not, O, Ga- o Jacob, my servant, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from far away. 
and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares Yahweh, for I am with you. I will make a full end of all the nations to which I have driven you. But of you I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. <laughs> You're going to be corrected here, but don't worry. This is not your end. Exactly. Yeah. Jeremiah 47, the word of Yahweh that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh struck down Gaza. Uh, And we know from other historical records that in the year 601 BC, Pharaoh Necho, after he drove back Nebuchadnezzar's invasion, um, this was before Nebuchadnezzar took. So again, we're still flashing back here. This is before the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Necho continued north and captured Gaza. Thus says Yahweh, Behold, waters are rising out of the north. Again, the Mm -hmm. cosmic north as well as geographic north. And shall become an overflowing torrent. They shall overflow the land and all that fills it, the city and those who dwell in it. Men shall cry out, and every inhabitant of the land shall wail. At the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his stallions, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of their wheels, the fathers look not back to their children, so feeble are their hands because of the day that is coming to destroy all the Philistines, to cut them off from Tyre and Sidon, every helper that remains. For Yahweh is destroying the Philistines, the remnant of the coastland of Kaftor. Kaftor is uh, Crete, which is Mm. the island that was, a lot of scholars believe, and uh, obviously the prophets too, believe is the origin point for the Philistines. They came Mm. from the Aegean. They were essentially cousins of the Greeks. Ah, okay. Yeah. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon has perished. O remnant of their valley, how long will you gash yourselves? Ah, sword of Yahweh, how long till you are quiet? Put yourself into your scabbard, rest and be still. How can it be quiet when Yahweh has given it a charge? Against Ashkelon and against the seashore he has appointed it. Chapter 48. Concerning Moab, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Woe to Nebo, for it is laid waste. Kiriath Aim is put to shame, it is taken. The fortress is put to shame and broken down. The renown of Moab is no more. In Heshbon they planned disaster against her. Come, let us cut her off from being a nation. You also, O oh madman, shall be brought to silence. The sword shall pursue you. A madman, by the way, is a location, not a uh, a name or type of entity. Um but they don't know exactly where it is, but they are scholars anyway, I interpret that as a, as, as a location instead of mad men. It literally means dunghill. Oh, huh, okay. Huh. Yeah. And Heshbon, by the way, was the uh, site of the kingdom of Sihon, ah. one of the last of the Amorite kings mm-hmm. during the time of uh, Moses and uh, Joshua. Verse three, a voice, a cry from Horanaim, desolation and great destruction. Moab is destroyed, her little ones have made a cry. For at the ascent of Luhith, they go up weeping. What's the ascent of Luhith? That's a location in southwestern Moab. Okay. For at the descent of Horonaim, they have heard the distressed cry of destruction. Um, Heard the cries from Mm -hmm. the Septuagint. Yeah. Flee, save yourselves. You will be like a juniper in the desert. For because you trusted in your works and your treasures, you also shall be taken. And Chemosh shall go into exile and his priests and his officials. That's interesting. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. Chemosh was the national god of um, of Moab. And I just read an interesting paper about Chemosh. Uh, because a scholar looked at it and said, you know, Moab and Israel appeared in the world stage in history at about the same time, Moab, Ammon, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Edom, and Israel, because they were all essentially descendants of, uh, well, the, well, the family Moab of Abraham. Well, Moab and Ammon from Lot. Right, right. So they, they came from, because um, uh, Lot was what, uh, Abraham's nephew, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So assen- essentially the descendants of Terah, the father of Abraham, mm-hmm. founded those small kingdoms, east and west of the Jordan River. 
uh, and they all appeared in history at about the same time. So this scholar decided it would be interesting to compare the careers of Yahweh, who clearly has survived. Gee, I wonder why. You know, scholar looking at it from a secular worldview is, you know, looking at this from a uh, scholarly, you know, well, gee, I wonder why this. Uh, How come we don't worship Chemosh anymore? What exactly. Happened what happened to Chemosh? Why did he fail? Well, it's because obviously he's not the creator of the universe. Exactly. But uh, he identified Chemosh as the god of war, Mars. Ares. Oh, of the Greeks. Mars that's the, yeah. interesting. Yes, yeah, so it is one and the same. Name means uh, subduer. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Chemosh, God of War. Well, that would make sense, subduer. Um, and Chemosh shall go into exile with his priests and his officials. The destroyer shall come upon every city, and no city shall escape. The valley shall perish, and the plain shall be destroyed, as, the, as Yahweh has spoken. Give wings to Moab, for she will fly, would fly away. Her cities shall become a desolation with no inhabitant in them. Cursed is he who does the work of Yahweh with slackness, and cursed is he who keeps back his sword from bloodshed. Hmm. Well, if the Lord asks you to do it, you better do it. Mm -hmm. Moab has been at ease from his youth and has settled on his dregs. He has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into exile... Hmm. So his taste remains in him, and his scent is not changed. Um, Interesting. Okay. He has not been emptied from vessel to vessel. So, okay. <laughs> Keeps consuming, but never empties out. Huh. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I shall send to him pourers who will pour him, and empty his vessels and break his jars in pieces. Then Moab shall be ashamed of Chemosh, as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, mm. their confidence. How do you say, we are heroes and mighty men of war? The destroyer of Moab and his cities has come up, and the choicest of his young men have gone down to slaughter, declares the king, capital K, whose name is Yahweh of hosts. The calamity of Moab is near at hand, and his affliction hastens swiftly. Hmm. Yeah, just a quick aside here. Destroyer in the Dictionary of Deities and Demons is uh, interpreted as being a supernatural envoy from Yahweh, whose job it was to annihilate large groups of people. Mm -hmm. And we see him in a number of places here in Jeremiah, of course, but also in um, uh, Deuteronomy 20. Um, verse 19. Different from the angel of death that we see going through the streets of Egypt during the Passover? Mm, or same thing? I I would think that that would be the same one. Um, yeah, yeah. Describes the, when the root appears, in other words, it describes deterioration, disfiguring, damaging, and destruction of people and things. So not just people necessarily, but... Um, yeah, the task of annihilating large groups of people, typically by means of a plague. Hmm. Huh. Deities in other near ancient cultures who annihilate populations are identified by personal names, such as Reshef mm -hmm. and Dever. Mm -hmm. So this is something similar to that. Uh, yeah, okay. Mm. So anyway, the destroyer. God, it's, it's not a an image or a concept or uh, a, a um, th this is an actual entity that God would, would deploy basically <laughs> give orders to go and wipe out these people as, as punishment. Well, let's, let me read verse 15 again, then yeah. the destroyer of Moab and his cities has come up and the choicest of his young men have gone down to slaughter. So this is the young men of Moab or of the destroyer. The destroyer of Moab and his cities has come up. The choicest of his young men. Well, that would be of Moab. The choicest of his young men have gone down to slaughter. That Okay. All right. Because they've been slaughtered. Right. Gone down to be slaughtered. Mm -hmm. Declares the king whose name is Yahweh of hosts. The calamity of Moab is near at hand and his affliction hastens swiftly. Grieve for him, all you who are around him and all you who know his name. Say, how the mighty scepter is broken, the glorious staff. 
come down from your glory and sit on the parched ground, O inhabitant of Dibon. For the destroyer of Moab has come against you. He has destroyed your strongholds. Stand by the way and watch, O inhabitant of Aurora. Ask him who flees and her who escapes. Say, what what has happened? Moab is put to shame, for it is broken. Wail and cry. Tell it beside the Arnon, a river, I assume. And Moab is laid waste. Judgment has come upon the tableland, upon Holon, and Jazah, and Mephaath, and Dibon, and Nebo, and Beth Diblathaim, and Kiriathaim, and Beth Gamul, and Beth Meon, and Kiriath, and Botzrah, and all the cities of the land of Moab far and near. The horn of Moab is cut off, and his arm is broken, declares Yahweh. Make him drunk! because he magnified himself against Yahweh, so that Moab shall wallow in his vomit, Hmm. and he too shall be held in derision. Was not Israel a derision to you? Was he found among thieves that whenever you spoke of him you wagged your head? Leave the cities and dwell in the rock, O inhabitants of Moab. Be like the dove that nests in the sides of the mouth of a gorge. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very strong. Sorry. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud of his loftiness, his pride and his arrogance and the haughtiness of his heart. I know his insolence, declares Yahweh. His boasts are false. His deeds are false. Therefore, I wail for Moab. I cry out for all Moab, for the men of Kir Haraseth. I mourn. More than for Jazer, I weep for you, O vine of Sibma. Your bre- this, a lot of this stuff is really hard to sort of slog through because there are place references that we know nothing about. Right, right. That, that really, in this day, you know, wail of you know, people in Chicago for what happened in, you know, uh, Rockford. <laughs> yeah, and you, 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 that, that you can get if, you, if you're familiar with American uh, geography. Uh-huh. J- just to give you at least a little bit of a reference, the, the Arnon River, which is mentioned here, um, flows into the east side of the, the Dead Sea. So that okay. gives you kind of a place reference as to where these, because these cities and places are kind of grouped around it. Um, Aurora, for example, is um, on the northern rim of a canyon that is formed by the Arnon River. So um, that that gives you a little bit of a, for, anyway, we're Here's talking the basically. the going the, up and sheltering and a dwell in the rock. Right. Uh, the area east of the Dead Sea mainly mm-hmm. is what we're talking about here. Um, verse 32 again, more than for Jazer, I weep for you, O vine of Sibma. Your branches passed over the sea, reached to the sea of Jazer. On your summer fruits and your grapes that destroy, sorry, I'm really having a hard time. My blood sugar is just for whatever reason crashing and I'm just having the hardest time reading. More than for Jazer, I weep for you, O vine of Sibma. Your branches passed over the sea, reached to the sea of Jazer on your summer fruits and your grapes, the destroyer, has fallen. Gladness and joy have been taken away from the fruitful land of Moab. I have made the wine cease from the wine presses. No one treads them with, sh- with shouts of joy. The shouting is not the shout of joy. You want to tag out for the rest of this chapter? <laughs> I think you, because it's really, really long. This is a long yeah, chapter. You, we probably play, should have stopped. Please take over, because yeah. I've got to go eat something. I'm yeah. about to crash. Verse 34. From the outcry at Heshbon, even to Eli... Eliale, as far as Jahaz, they utter their voice, from Zoar to Horonayim to Eglath Shelashiah. For the waters of Nimrim also have become desolate, and I will bring to an end in Moab, declares Yahweh, him who offers sacrifice in the high place and makes offerings to his God. Therefore my heart moans for Moab like a flute, and my heart moans like a flute for the men of Kirharasheth, Haraseth. Therefore the riches they gained have perished. For every head is shaved and every beard cut off. On all the hands are gashes, and around the waist is sackcloth. Again, these are the pagan mourning rituals or or practices that we talked about earlier. On all the housetops of Moab and in the squares, there is nothing but lamentation, for I have broken Moab like a vessel for which no one cares, declares Yahweh. How it is broken, how they wail, how Moab has turned his back in shame. So Moab has become a derision and a horror to all that are around him. 
For thus says Yahweh, Behold, one shall fly swiftly like an eagle and spread his wings against Moab. The cities shall be taken and the strongholds seized. The heart of the warriors of Moab shall be in that day like the heart of a woman in her birth pains. Moab shall be destroyed and be no longer a people because he magnified himself against Yahweh. Terror, pit, and snare are before you, O inhabitant of Moab, declares Yahweh. He who flees from the terror shall fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For I will bring these things upon Moab the year of their punishment, declares Yahweh. In the shadow of Heshbon, fugitives fugitives stop without strength, for fire came out from Heshbon, flame from the house house of Sihon. It has destroyed the forehead of Moab, the crown of the sons of Tumult. Woe to you, O Moab! The people of Chemosh are undone, for your sons have been taken captive and your daughters into captivity. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in the latter days, declares Yahweh. Thus far is the judgment on Moab. Well, and that is, can we stop there for I think, today? I think we can. We still got I'm sitting four- here eating some string cheese now. Yeah, verses 49 and 50, and uh, those are relatively long chapters, but it's more judgments on the nations and some really fascinating stuff coming. Uh, and I don't want to just you know run through it no, really no, no, quickly no. because it, it, this is stuff that's really, really meaty. <laughs> right. So uh, chapter 49, judgment on Ammon, on Edom. These are all the nearby neighbors of Israel. Uh, mm-hmm. Damascus. Kidar and Hazor, those are, uh, Kidar is in Arabia. Hazor is um, north in uh, Syria. Hmm. Uh, Elam, are of course. Are we going in kind of a circle around um, Israel? Not precisely, but basically sur- all the surrounding nations. And then Jeremiah 50 uh, comes back to Babylon, who um, through the Chaldeans, God is using as uh, judgment against Egypt and uh, the other nations. Because it <laughs> Sam was the- just, po- sorry, he just poked his head up. Hey, I smell string cheese. <laughs> Uh, Jeremiah 51 uh, prophesies the utter destruction of Babylon. And uh, so, yeah, prophecies against the nations um, for the next few chapters. And then uh, 52 is um, sort of a recounting of the fall of Jerusalem. So, mm. yeah, so we will we will continue with the um, prophecies against the nations in Jeremiah. And uh, why am I bringing that up there? I was looking at our schedule here. Um so anyway, but that that will be next week as we continue on, and then we get into um, the Book of Lamentations, and then just a few weeks we'll start on the Book of Ezekiel, one of the most fascinating of the books in the uh, in the entire Bible. Well, and before you know it, we're going to be up against March and heading down to Dallas. So if yeah. you are going to be joining us there, we are so looking forward to saying hello. Yeah, let us know. And you're there. You can save $20 off the registration for the Hear the Watchman Conference. That's March 22nd through the 25th at the uh, Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center in Grapevine, Texas. $20 off with the promo code Gilbert20, Gilbert20. If you choose to use the, uh, in, instead of going, if you want to get, or you can do both, actually. Get the video stream for later use to show people back home. Because you can watch for six months. Yeah. So you can invite people over afterward. Hey, I saw these great talks in Dallas. Come on over. Let's watch these Um you watch through Vimeo, and if you've got an HDMI out on your computer, which most laptops do these days, plug it into your television set, and you can run it right through your TV. And you can show it at church and your you right. know, Bible study groups or whatever. I mean, a lot of times you can go back and you can say to your pastor, "You, I wish you could have gone to this. Let me show you why this is so great. Can can I show this on Sunday night or whatever? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we can save 20%, save 20% off the uh, the cost, which is only 49 bucks. So knock uh, 10 bucks off, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the promo code Gilbert20 and the website to sign up, of course, is hearthewatchmen.com. That's hearthewatchmen.com. Um, awesome. Yeah. So you find links to that uh, at the uh, the site. I'll put that, uh, yeah, it's in the right-hand column there. Where at at uh, gilberthouse.org. Gilberthouse.org, where you'll also find links to subscribe to the podcast, whether you're using iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker. You can also download the free app. Links to the app stores are posted at uh, gilberthouse.org. Cool. So... Well, let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll... Uh, uh, I'm going to finish my let, cheese. Let you finish your cheese. <laughs> Father, thank you for this day and for this time that we've shared together through your word. Uh, Lord, Your even in, in some of these prophecies and things that we have skipped over in the past, because we, we think, well, the, these, are, these have been fulfilled already. They don't really pertain to us, but we see glimpses of the supernatural war between you and the gods, the small g gods who rebelled, gods like Chemosh and Milcom and the queen of heaven and so forth. Uh, and Lord, we are 
thankful that you have opened our eyes to the reality of their existence. But still, Lord, your supremacy, you are the creator who spoke all things, including them, into existence. And that is something that the enemy cannot abide. But because your spirit is in us, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. While we may be oppressed and tried in this life, you have already won the victory. And it's just for us to endure and soldier on, run the race to the best of our ability until that day when we are called home or when you return. And Lord, we pray that day comes soon. We pray for missionaries who are taking gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray for the wisdom to make disciples of all nations, that we would reflect the love that you have shown to us, to all people, so that we would not become a stumbling block to those who do not yet know the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for strength and for your comfort and for your healing touch on those who are struggling and suffering physically or emotionally, financially, Lord, we we pray. And uh, Father, again, we just ask for wisdom and discernment as we study your word and as we try to make sense of the world around us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. And by the way, you're cute. <laughs> just wanted to, I hadn't said that during the show, and I, I know that, uh, you know, I just want everybody to know that I just, I love you. I you're love just you, cute as a button. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm not done. saying that just because I'm drunk on cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.